So welcome back, everybody. Um, for those of you I have not yet met, my name is Susan Shingledecker. I am ESIP's Executive Director. I hope that you had a great day yesterday. I know for me, the research showcase was a, a huge highlight. Um, for those of you who either were there and didn't get to see every poster you wanted to see, or those of you who missed it, that space remains open. So I really encourage you. It's one of our strongest research showcase, I think, we, that I have seen. Um, we have over 30 posters and demos there. Um, there's ability to leave feedback for the authors. And some of the authors have even made themselves available at other times um, the rest of the week to be in the space for conversations. Um, what I loved about it was the time for really great one-on-one -on -one conversations, both with people I've never met before and with people I was really excited to see again. Um, so I encourage you to check that out. So I am excited for today's plenary. And um, I wanted to tell you a little bit about how this came about. Most of you know that in addition to ESIP's meetings like this one and our 30 clusters that meet monthly, we help lead and design workshops and meetings for our agency partners. This October, we had the privilege to help design and deliver NASA's Earth System Digital Twins Workshop for three days in DC. This actually was one of our first in-person workshops in many years. We had two and a half days of great presentations and conversations. What I enjoy most from ESIP's engagement in workshops like this is bringing broader participation to the conversation. And in this case, we were even able to support an ESIP Community Fellows participation in the workshop. And after three days of passionate conversations around digital twins, it was clear that the broader ESIP community should hear about this work and engage in this conversation. So it is my honor to elevate this conversation to be the focus for today's plenary. From here, I will turn it over to Thomas Wang, Technical Group Supervisor with NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory and the California Institute of Technology, and Phil Yang, Professor of Geographic Information Science and Director of the NSF Spatial Temporal Innovation Center at George Mason University. They have organized a great panel for you, and I look forward to robust discussion following their talk. To ask questions throughout, you can use the Slido tab in Kiko Chat or um, we will put that link in the chat. So I'll turn it over to you, Phil and Thomas. Well, thank you, Susan. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, we have uh, four exciting speakers here lined up for you. Um, our time is really tight, although, oh, Thomas is here. I was uh, wondering about when we ask about what do you think first when you say digital twins? There's one exciting Grace over there, Thomas Huang. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, thank you, Thomas. Uh, let me just uh, drop your kids at school and come uh, back just on time. Uh, so without spending too much time on uh, introducing the background, we will dive right into the presentations. Our first uh, presenter, Benjamin Smith from NASA JPL, and he's part of the NASA AIST team, uh, Advanced Information Science and Technology team, which probably is one of the first agency program funded 14 digital twins project. And he's part of the team managing those 14 projects. So Ben, please take away. All right, and is that sharing okay? Yes. Great, all right, uh, thank you. Welcome everybody. Uh, so, uh, uh, like Phil said, I'm an associate with the NASA's Advanced Information Systems Technology Program. Uh, and uh, one of the thrust areas, uh, research thrust areas there is uh, all around digital twins. Uh, so I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, uh, what, uh, what the program is doing there. Um, so first of all, for those who don't know, the um, uh, uh, NASA has an Earth Science Technology Office within the um, Earth Science Division. Um, uh, this is where the AIST program sits. Uh, so ESTO leads technology development uh, activities uh, for the Earth Science Division, uh, infusing into technologies into uh, uh, all aspects of the Earth Science um, uh, Division. Um, and so you can see some of the other programs there, uh, but uh, AIST is the one that uh, focuses on advanced uh, information systems, uh, technology and software. So we have, uh, there are three, uh, three thrusts there. Uh, so new observing strategies, analytic collaborative frameworks and earth system digital twins. Um, so I, I won't go too much into these on, uh, on this slide because I think on the, this next one here shows a little bit more how these, uh, these fit together. Um, 
So the, the focus today is, of course, on Earth Systems Digital Twins. And I'm going to talk a little bit more in the next few slides about uh, what uh, uh, what that means, or at least so one definition of what that means uh, and, what, and what some of the activities are going on there. Um, but I just wanted to mention that there, the, uh, how the other uh, research thrust areas fit into that as well. Uh, so we also have uh, new observing strategies, uh, which is looking at uh, coordinating observations across uh, multiple kinds of uh, satellites and in situ sensors, uh, possibly also including commercial CubeSats. Um, and uh, so that's a way to dynamically uh, obtain more observations about the Earth systems, which could then fit into an Earth system digital twin. Uh, another thrust area is analytic collaborative framework. So those are about how do you bring together uh, data from uh, a diverse set of um, uh, instruments and, and missions uh, when you want to study a particular uh, particular system or discipline. Uh, often those that the data is, uh, you know, spread over different uh, systems. So you want to bring that together and harmonize it, being able to analyze that uh, in an effective way. So that's also uh, could be seen as uh, uh, one of the things that you need to do for an Earth system digital twin, and so those technologies feed in that uh, as well. All right. So, uh, what do we mean by an Earth system digital twin? Well, you can think of this as, as having um, kind of, the, and we're talking about kind of the the big big vision here, right? Um, is uh, uh, having kind of three main components. Um, so you can think of a uh, uh, a digital replica which is looking at uh, an integrated picture of the, the past and, and current states of the Earth system. So kind of, you know, you know, I'll pull up this next one, you know, what, what's happening now? So uh, this is uh, what's happening now uh, on the Earth system. You want to maybe be able to uh, look at uh, a, a particular a particular system, say like a um, well, let's say like a forest fire or something like that. And you might want to be able to, to look at, at, at what's happening with that, that, that system in terms of maybe like air, uh, land cover, uh, you know, how does the hydrology systems impact that? You're going to want, want to look at that system from, from um, uh, multiple different angles and, and understand uh, kind of what's happening now with your system. Uh, and then there's forecasting. So now that we understand what's happening now, what's, what's, what's next? I always, as you run those, those models and data, forward, uh, what happens next with the, uh, the system, and what's our picture of kind of how that evolves uh, in the future from that current state. And then the last element is uh, what if, right? So these are being able to do impact uh, assessments and projections. So given different assumptions about uh, uh, about the, the Earth systems, you know, what are those boundary conditions, uh, you know, how will major forcing variables change in the future? Um, uh, how are those systems likely to uh, to evolve in the uh, in the future, right? Uh, and those can help us with things like uh, looking at uh, applications, uh, policy decisions, um, and uh, and applications like that. Uh, so that's that's kind of the big the big vision. And then on the on the right are are some of the the elements that that uh, contribute to that, right? So you need continuous observations of those interacting Earth systems. Uh, to feed all of this, uh, to the extent that Earth systems, uh, you know, interact with uh, human systems, like um, everything from agriculture to infrastructure, uh, you want to have some data about those those two. Uh, you're pulling data from many disparate sources, right? So it's not just one instrument or, or one uh, satellite. You're pulling in from a lot of these. And so you need to bring that data together, uh, harmonize it. You've got a lot of data to deal with. Um, and uh, um, you know, so storing it and dealing with it and harmonizing it, that's all very important. Uh, interconnected models. So you've got, for all each of these Earth systems, you've got a model. Those models all need to talk together uh, in order to understand how the, the, those Earth systems evolve uh, as interconnected systems. Um, you want to be able to look at this at multiple physical and temporal scales. So um, you know, some models and some data are only a particular um, uh, scale, and you might want to be able to zoom in and see what's what's happening. You might want to be able to uh, go forward, fast forward, or rewind, right? So you want to be able to look at all of these different scales. Um, uh, you need uh, speed for these, right? So you be able to do prediction analysis and visualization. So that's how you bring those all together. Uh, but then you also need to be able to uh, 
depending on exactly what you want to do with it, uh, be able to run those fairly uh, quickly if you want to be able to, to interact with them. Some things you need to interact with quickly, other things you can wait longer for. Um, there's some, you know, this is a scale. Um, so things like machine learning and certainly quantification are uh, a big, can be a big part of that, both for analyzing the data and also for doing things like uh, surrogate models that might speed up computation. Uh, and then the whole thing needs to run at scale. You know, you've got a lot of data, you've got a lot of models, um, you've got a lot of visualizations uh, that's going to need to run on, um, you know, at scale, probably in cloud computing platforms. So again, this is kind of at the, uh, at the, at the, at the vision level. There's a lot of pieces here that are going to need to be uh, uh, done. SD is not going to do all of that. Uh, so, uh, but this is the, uh, uh, this is the vision where we want to go. All right, so if you look at this uh, in terms of capabilities, so here's another way. So one of the uh, is looking at some of the, what the technologies can contribute to this. Um, so there's a lot in, the, in, the, in these charts, uh, but uh, uh, so the first one is the up-to-date digital replica uh, of the past current states of the system. So you can see here just a number of the kind of the technology, technology areas that might contribute to that. So you need, uh, how do you, uh, harmonize that data and get seamless access to it. Uh, how do you get uh, uh, observations, you know, both continuous uh, observations and maybe targeted ones. Data assimilation and infusion is important. How do you get that data in, assimilate it with models? Uh, and then, of course, you know, being able to run that quickly. When you move forward into looking at uh, real time or, or forecasting the future states of the system, um, then you also uh, add, you know, pulls in a lot some of those those same capabilities, but you also need things like your advanced computational capabilities. Maybe you need to run on GPUs, uh, surrogate modeling, which I, I talked about briefly was, you know, um, uh, surrogate models that might run faster, forecasting models. So maybe you may need some changes to the models to be able to forecast the kinds of things that you're that you're interested in uh, or so that they work together better. Uh, impact assessment. Um, so for, for running what if scenarios. So you're gonna need all of that plus things like uh, visualization, mixed reality, uh, be able to do interactive um, uh, uh, interaction with the data. Uh, and, and then there's also, you know, uncertainty quantification kind of cuts, cuts across all of this, right? At any one of these levels, you know, you're gonna need uh, to understand where your uncertainties are in the system uh, uh, so that you can, you know, assess the, assess the results properly. And then wrapping around all of this is you need some sort of information systems to, you know, tie these elements together uh, in, into a, a cohesive system. So there was a recent solicitation called AIST 21. Uh, this is out of the uh, ROSES Research Opportunities in Earth Science. Um, uh, out of that, as you can see, some of the technology areas that were that were solicited there, which reflect some of what I was just talking about. Uh, but there are 14 uh, projects that were selected relative uh, related to Earth System Digital Twins that are starting to build out on some of these areas. So these include things like the ESDT um, infrastructure. So building that kind of wraparound uh, elements that would uh, start to bring some of these technologies together. Uh, AI surrogate modeling, uh, analytic framework developments, and then also a handful of uh, prototypes that are starting to put together digital twins for uh, for focused uh, for focused areas and, and, and systems. So in this next one, I just want to just kind of briefly touch on a couple examples here, just to give you a, a sense for some of the kinds of things that are going on. Uh, this one here is uh, <coughs> uh, uh, Allison Gray out of the University of Washington that's looking at a digital twin of uh, earth and sea, uh, sorry, air sea interactions. So looking at, you know, how does um, uh, uh, the atmosphere system interact with the, uh, uh, with the sea and uh, in particular looking at, uh, at heat fluxes. Uh, and so how do you uh, do things like look at, at both how do those, how do those interact? Um, and then, um, uh, surrogate models for uh, for speeding that up and understanding the, uh, uh, the interactions between those. Uh, this is another one uh, looking at uh, uh, called ideas, looking at uh, the, the infrastructure uh, level. Um, so this is um, bringing together as uh, kind of both that infrastructure and all on the prototype side, uh, looking at and bringing together a number of different. Um, uh, whoops, I'm sorry, existing systems, um, 
uh, including things like uh, uh, hydrology models, land surface models, uh, uh, power models, um, and uh, uh, and then being able to do uh, analyses there for you know water cycle and, and flood detection monitoring. So this is bringing together a lot of those kinds of things, uh, and also um, uh, federating with uh, other systems uh, such as the, uh, uh, the the flood dam system. All right, and then one more, this one here is called Tire Hydro and it's looking at uh, surrogate ML modeling uh, for uh, hydrology systems. So how do you build up those uh, machine learning models uh, that would be able to do the surrogate modeling run much, run much faster, which should then allow you to do uh, different kinds of um, uh, interactions uh, among, those, uh, among those systems. All right, uh, so, uh, that's kind of the whirlwind tour of, of uh, uh, efforts going on within the AISD towards uh, Earth System Digital Twins. Uh, this one here is a, a wordle of uh, uh, some of the different uh, uh, topics that were uh, that were addressed uh, for fun, uh, and a uh, you know, website there for more information as well. All right, with that, I'll stop and uh, hand it back over to you, Phil, for uh, our next panelist. Well, thank you, Ben. Uh, so for everyone, I know you have a lot of questions, but we want to keep the question to the end so we can have some live discussions. Please put your question in the Slido, which is linked in the chat window. Susan just sent it out. Uh, so Thomas. All right, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, geez, okay. I'd love to do the internet here. <laughs> so in case, um, hopefully it uh, goes out correctly, uh, my voice. Um, thank you for the, uh, I really want to thank you for the, the speaker and thanks Ben for uh, kind of kick off the speaker here. Um, from, you know, for those of you who've been to any of my uh, digital twin talks, I, I always talk about the digital twin is, uh, is a community effort, is a global effort, uh, is not just uh, one agency building one thing. Um, this is why I'm so excited to, to be able to invite uh, two of our European partner uh, to uh, today's uh, uh, plenary. Um, and if you're going to be in EGU uh, in April, definitely look out for the digital twin session there. Uh, we will be there and for the very same reason to working across uh, the globe to really formalizing what a digital twin uh, should be, uh, what a common characteristic are they are we looking for useful architecture and solutions. Um, for that, I would like to invite our um, next speaker, um, uh, Look at uh, Jean-Marc um, David from uh, Kness. And, and John, uh, is, I have the privilege of meeting with him uh, last year uh, at Kness uh, uh, and, uh, and working with his team uh, at Kness. Uh, John re received his uh, PhD in signal and image processing uh, from the uh, groups in France and uh, or my, my regular friends. Uh, in 20, 2003, uh, he's then worked for uh, the French space agency, CNES, uh, in the field of a very high resolution Earth observation uh, satellite uh, design. Um, in 2018, he developed the, uh, the CNES Earth Observation Lab uh, in charge of applications using spatial data uh, in close collaboration with the um, uh, now called the Space for Climate Observatory or SCO initiative. Uh, since the 2022, uh, he's been has ensured the uh, technical coordination of the uh, CNES data campus, uh, a division in charge of all CNES spatial data, uh, and uh, the, the specialization to uh, um, final use. Uh, his area of interest is in image processing, uh, in particular, for uh, geometry and issues data, the um, hybridization in Earth observation and Earth digital twins for coastal risk, urban, and Orsha, so we are really excited to see um, uh, the work that uh, Jean Marks going to share with us because uh, this is actually, they are looking at an even broader uh, range of digital twin capabilities. So um, with that, uh, Jean, can you share your screen? Yes, uh, thank you very much, uh, Thomas. <laughs> I, I, I share my screen. Uh, okay. It, it is okay for you. you, you can see my screen and, uh, and you hear me? Yep, looks great. Yeah, okay, perfect. 
Uh, thank you very much for, for the invitation. Um, so I am Jean-Marc David. I'm, I work in the French uh, uh, National Space Agency, and I will talk about what we call uh, our uh, my department uh, at uh, CNES uh, is, a, is a new department, in fact, and uh, we gathered all the engineers and researchers to cover the world data value chain uh, to support the world ecosystem to take advantage of uh, all the space data, algorithm, uh, and so on. So for us, it is logical to, to work on digital twins uh, because we want to gather all the uh, the final user, uh, industry, institutional, researcher, defense, and so on. We work on uh, different uh, thematics uh, for society, for defense and security, for our environment, and also, of course, scientific uh, uh, thematics. Uh, it is very important uh, for us uh, to manage all the, the information and the uh, all, all the bricks, the tools uh, to, to process uh, the, the space data, the data coming from satellites, but also to, we want to make an hybridization between uh, this kind of data, uh, satellite data, of course, in-situ data, and also all the model we have uh, from uh, our scientific uh, scientists. Um, in uh, to to do all this uh, work we work with uh, th through lots of collaboration uh, institutional in europe of course but also uh, with the us partner um what uh, what we call a digital twin uh, in fact this last months um, I've seen the, the emergence of many global digital twin uh, initiatives uh, in fact, the challenge of these global digital twins is to create uh, something which is very important, a qualified uh, digital replica model of our planet, making it possible to monitor, simulate, and anticipate natural phenomena and human activities. Um, in fact, we uh, have different uh, users. Uh, we want to... Uh, to to work for different users, uh, either scientists and also decision makers. Um, through uh, the digital twin, uh, we have uh, access to a digital representation of an environment using all available spatial and non-spatial data uh, accompanied with a set of physical and statistical model to calculate projection uh, replay past events or simulate future ones. Uh, in fact, uh, we one thing which is very important for us uh, is that we we want to uh, to use uh, all the knowledge uh, we have on uh, uh, an area and complementary to the global approach of the digital twin, uh, we work a lot. Uh, on a notion of local and dated digital twins. Uh, this notion of local and dated uh, for us is, uh, is essential. And uh, uh, we consider uh, a representation uh, of a restricted geographic area of interest uh, with uh, uh, different thematics like urban area, like watershed, like coastline, and uh, using this uh, local area, uh, working on this local area uh, allows us to access to very high resolution data. And also we want to have uh, what we call fresh data uh, in two dimension or three dimension. Uh, we have also in-situ data and we have also small mesh physical model. Um, in fact, this is, uh, this is local and this is a user-centered uh, and thematic approach um, which uh, responds 
finally and pragmatically to the uh, to, to to the objectives of uh, of the to, to to the question of of final user and uh, we want uh, in fact have a, a something which is very complementary to uh, the global uh, digital twins we we all, all, all the world work on and to uh, to build in fact this uh, this digital twin with which is um, uh, in fact uh, uh, ephemeral uh, we need to to have lots of tools uh, to to build the the digital twin and this all these tools uh, can uh, provide us a specific digital twin a local digital twin and we uh, we put uh, all these tools on on we what we call a, a digital twin factory uh, it is uh, important uh, for uh, answer to all the question of uh, science, scientist, of course, but also decision maker. Um, we uh, can uh, also, uh, uh, through these tools, use uh, all the classical thematics we uh, we we have uh, in uh, signal and image processing. We use uh, all the uh, artificial intelligence algorithm, uh, classical algorithm. Uh, uh, and so on, and we are able to compose, to build data cube, which are uh, the replica of the of the local zone, uh, on which we are able to uh, process, model, uh, physical modelization or st statistical uh, modelization. Uh, for example, we can uh, give uh, uh, here uh, different example. Um, in the case of uh, urban digital twins, in fact, uh, to to manage all the the the, the, the different function of the of the of the urban area, uh, we want to to have um, a, a fine replica of the urban area. For this fine replica, we need to have uh, a 3D representation uh, of uh, the this urban area. But we want to have this 3D representation uh, in uh, high resolution. It is mandatory to uh, to use uh, modelization or of uh, of uh, urban climate, for example, uh, to not to 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 compute this modelization uh, with uh, lots of errors. So the high resolution. Uh, in the local area is, is mandatory. Uh, in the data cube of the urban digital uh, twins, we can also add all the information on the land cover of the high and low vegetation uh, uh, map uh, of the urban area. We can also uh, give information on, um, for example, the urban heat island with using uh, infrared, uh, thermal uh, images uh, we can also use uh, in situ information like the 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 roof type classification we give uh, us some information uh, to use uh, some modelization linked to the heat iceland for example and uh, if you want to uh, to monitor uh, some uh, information about the biodiversity for example we can add on uh, in our data cube the information, for example, of the of the urban light to uh, to assess the urban light pollution uh, source. Uh, another example uh, we have uh, there is uh, the digital twin uh, of uh, watershed. Uh, in this case, we work with uh, with Thomas uh, on on this subject. And uh, we want to uh, assess uh, very quickly uh, a map of uh, the, uh, the information of the, the flooded areas. In fact, uh, we, uh, like all our local digital twin, we are able 
to compute a, a digital replica of the watershed using uh, information, 3D information, using land cover information, uh, using where is the water and where is no, uh, where is the no water. And we are able to, uh, to, to manage to different model, model of flooding and also uh, model of, um, uh, of uh, all, all the water um, uh, coming through the, 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 the hill uh, in, the, in the watershed. Uh, linked to this information, we also in this project work with uh, private companies which are able to, um, to define uh, different uh, indicators. So, uh, for example, risk indicators, but also uh, they can uh, use these indicators to give some uh, advice, some information to, uh, to final users, which are, uh, for example, uh, uh, decision makers. Uh, the, it is important for them to to uh, have a representation, uh, an inf uh, a great representation of uh, of all the, the information we have compute. And uh, a, a last example, uh, a last example here, uh, which is uh, very important for us, is the digital twin uh, on a coastal zone. Uh, in this example. Uh, uh, one thing which is very important uh, uh, for uh, this is our digital twin factory, we, we want to, to manage, uh, to, to, to build a replica of the, um, of, the, of the coastal zone. And the replica of the coastal zone consists in uh, having a, a continuum between the bathymetry uh, and the topography uh, taking into account the intertidal zone uh, and uh, assess, assessing the shoreline uh, evolution. And in fact, uh, all this information uh, could be done with satellite uh, data, with spatial data, with space data. Uh, we, we are able to uh, build this replica uh, everywhere in the world. But in fact, uh, the, the information uh, is very important um, in, a, in a restricted uh, area. Uh, on the topography, we are able also to, uh, to give information on uh, land use, uh, on, the, on, on where, are the, where is the economy, where is the, the patrimonial uh, information, where, where, is the, uh, where, are where, where live people, and so on. And on this uh, digital replica, we are able uh, to simulate a uh, model. Uh, we, we can, for example, simulate a decadal storm or something like that. And we are able to assess the impact of uh, this kind of, of model. And this information are very important to uh, manage the, uh, what we call the what if. What, if we change something, uh, on the topography, uh, there is uh, a, a, a different uh, impact of uh, the decadal storm. So the digital twins allows us to uh, to do all all these uh, all these kind of things. Uh, one thing which is very important uh, is uh, to uh, federate all the digital twin efforts we have. Uh, in fact. Uh, one thing which is important, we have data. We need to have something which we, we want, we, we call uh, certified data. This is very important. For the model, which is something is very important is to, to have uh, an authoritative science uh, model, uh, which uh, is uh, uh, accepted by all the scientists at, and this model can be used for all the use we want uh, uh, to do with all our digital twins. Uh, in fact, in the digital twin factory, uh, it is very important also uh, to have a notion of interoperability of all the data layers, but also, also all the, the models. 
uh, this is important to uh, to make um, the the digital twin compliant to different kind of models, different uh, models which come from different um, scientist teams, uh, and uh, it's important to to share the the same need, the definition, and so on. Uh, so, uh, in fact, uh, and to 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 end my my talk, uh, it is important to to work uh, on uh, a local uh, digital twin, which is uh, dated and uh, thematics. Uh, to work on this digital twin factory, it is important to, to promote also standardization uh, of all the interface to, can, uh, to, to, uh, to be able to, to change uh, algorithm, to change model, and, and to test and to compare uh, different, uh, different results on, on different cases and to federate uh, all our efforts. So thank you, uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mark. This is very interesting work. Um, I'm actually learning a lot that uh, you guys are doing a lot more than just from the flood dam efforts. Uh, this is really exciting. Um, so um, if, uh, for those of you who um, I know from, there's a link on Slido. Uh, please definitely uh, log into Slido or just click the link. Uh, there's some very interesting questions there. We hope to have some uh, time uh, after all the presentation to uh, go over some of them. Uh, so submit your vote on some of the questions or post your own questions. Um, with that, I'm going to give you the distinct privilege to introduce uh, Dr. Peter Bauer. Um, and, and Peter is, uh, if you ever search for Digital twin, you probably will find his work. <laughs> uh, so I really appreciate uh, both our European partner able to join us today, and uh, and it was dinner time for them. Um, so Dr. Peter Bauer is the director of uh, European Commission for flagship activity on uh, the destination Earth uh, at the ECMWF. Um, he obtained his uh, PhD uh, degree in geology from the University of Hamburg, uh, Germany. Uh, during his career, he was. Uh, awarded a postdoctoral and research fellowship uh, yeah. working at NOAA and NASA uh, in the US uh, and IPSL in France. Uh, he led research team on satellite um, geology at uh, DLR in Germany before joining uh, ECMWF in 2000, where he has led the activity and satellite data assimilation, model development, and scalability. Um, he also coordinated the uh, Extreme Earth Project, uh, that was the predecessor for now the Destination Earth. Uh, he has been a member uh, advisory committee for um, National Weather Services, um, the World Meteorological uh, Organization, and the European Space Agency. So um, really excited to have you here today, uh, Peter. Take it away. Thanks very much. Was, uh, I'll try to share my screen um, and hope. Uh, this uh, this works. Can you see that? Yes, you can see your screen. Fantastic. Um, so I just want to uh, kind of add to the you know definition ecosystem of digital twins a little uh, the way we see it uh, and how this is uh, fed into the European Destination Earth Initiative. I'll tell you a bit about Destination Earth at the very end, but it's a uh, project that exists that's funded by the European Commission um, and for which we share responsibility with the European Space Agency and UMITSAT, which is the European Meteorological Satellite Agency. Um, so for us, um, a destination Earth requires three fundamental ingredients uh, and only the sum of them actually make the digital twin deserve the name digital twin. So number one is that you want to have a certain level of quality, so accuracy with which you reproduce what you're simulating uh, in your twin and observing, of course. So ideally, you um, base your digital twin on the best available simulations with the most realistic models. And that can mean different things to, to different people. Uh, and of course, depending on what you're trying to do. The second one is that it needs to come with impacts. Uh, so it's not just a digital twin of, 
of a physical system, but it includes the, the human system and the societal system. So it's the, the combination of the physical world and everything that matters to society, so food, water, energy, health, for example. And then lastly, uh, you want, of course, the best possible and most realistic replica of, of that, but you also want to interact with it. And this is where this what if comes in. So, so you want to be able to change things and rerun simulations or add your own observations and see if that changes something. And I think a lot of cases of examples of digital twins that you see out there, that part is really but to me, it's actually a necessary condition for digital twins. So this interactivity and configurability uh, is what allows you to change things and really dive into and immerse yourself in the information and then make it, your, make it work your way for your specific application. So uh, we published a couple of papers on this and, and one was uh, in uh, nature climate change uh, a couple of years ago that's on the left hand side and it's it's really all, all about this you know the, these three principles but mostly you know highly accurate information bringing together physical worlds anthropogenic or, or human systems and then this interactivity and regarding this interactivity what you want and it's tried we illustrate it with the picture on the left is that you know different types of users with different kind of knowledge or expertise can actually interact with the system. They don't necessarily need to know where things happen. Not necessarily everybody is, of course, allowed to touch everything, but they don't necessarily need to know uh, how things and where things work, uh, but they are able to extract the information they acquire and play with the system to the level of expertise they have. Of course, and you all know that, um, that comes with challenges on the right hand side you know we're dealing with a complex physical problem uh, it's our cyber physical interaction so real world uh, simulated world uh, we're dealing with an earth system where we don't understand necessarily everything uh, everything operates on different time scales it's, it contains complex life cycles of components we only have limited data to support what we simulate with observations uh, observations are not perfect so they're sparse, they're noisy, um, and the whole thing evolves. And certainly with climate change, you know, what we may safely assume today may not work anymore tomorrow. So interestingly, the right-hand side of the slide was not designed for Earth systems, but for aerospace systems. And it's a courtesy of Karen Wilcox at the University of Texas. Um, who, who gave that to me. Uh, but it shows that, you know, this should actually have even if they are from engineering or earth systems, similarities. And there's a lot of experience actually in industry that we, with the earth systems only entering that space, can actually learn from. So, as, as you will know, and this is why we have this meeting uh, to begin with, uh, increasingly the digital twins gain momentum community. Uh, we ourselves have published on it, uh, we've contributed to publication publications on this uh, there was already questions in the chat in the chat whether it's only for like uh, states that you can observe not for climate but we believe there's a, a strong role for digital twins in climate as well we published on this uh, in the royal society papers but also private companies increasingly get interested nvidia for example has made an announcement for their own view on digital twins with earth 2 uh, and you know, as Nvidia is a powerful company uh, and contains a lot of, uh, comes with a lot, with a lot of intelligence, uh, we can be sure that they will pull this off one way or another. So we ideally partner up with them to to make that happen. So we believe that we need unprecedented simulation capabilities, uh, and if we talk about you know the, the global Earth system, this comes with very uh, grand challenges of, uh, at the science front of Arctic sea ice, ocean circulation, atmosphere, land surfaces, ice sheets, and how this comes together. And apparently, uh, uh, high resolution and resolving small scales, small scale effects that have a, a large impact on large scales, and therefore on everything that we're trying to, to predict for the future, or even properly represent uh, today, 
requires a resolution. And of course, that comes with a huge uh, computing footprint. So that's that's one part of the problem. We need unprecedented observation cap observational capabilities, which has been mentioned before as well. So it's the usual uh, uh, observing systems that we rely on, for example, uh, in, in weather forecasting for creating initial conditions. But it needs a lot more. It needs specialist observatories. It needs new types of, of observations that we haven't looked at much yet, like a mobile phone or, or car sensor information. So anything that we can think of serves the purpose of, of what we are trying to focus our digital twin efforts at. And of course, all of this comes with an in, in incredible uh, digital footprint. So one is on computing. And we've started to look at the computing tasks that digital twins come with uh, in a quite broad sense, actually, that goes even beyond high performance computing. So we, in, in traditional weather forecasting, and climate forecast the prediction, we, we mostly think about high performance computing. But in the end, we need to look at everything that's in this, in this circle on the left hand side, you know, intelligent sensors and networks and how to, you know, relieve to do less centralization of, of computation, actually, and data handling, for example. Um, machine learning plays a role everywhere. Uh, it's not only high performance and centralized computing, but distributed computing and cloud computing, of course. Uh, IoT uh, plays a role, and ideally, we find ways to uh, to kind of take benefit uh, of this the incredible developments that happen right now in all of these little sub circles in the big circle uh, for our benefit. But some of it is so complicated uh, in terms of technologies, and, and high performance computing is no different. So the new systems that we're seeing are, are very complex and complicated in terms of architectures. So for us, it's not straightforward to actually use them. And we need to define ways for how to do that. So it's, it's by no means a, a, a thinking of whereby we just have a big problem, you know, and we, we put it on some general purpose machine. And ta-da, we have a, an acceleration of a factor of 100 or so. So we, we thought about this a lot across disciplines uh, and together with people who actually do not have a climate or weather background, but come from computer science and com computational science. And we've written another paper for how this could work on uh, for Earth systems. And it basically requires redesigning the entire way we do our simulations today, the way we're combining simulations with observations, and the way we map our very specific diversity of compute problems on the architectures that exist. And that's not just processor architectures, but also memory uh, architectures. Then, you know, how, how we federate this uh, across clouds and uh, across the avail available clouds or available infrastructures. So there are big systems out there that come, that fill some of the uh, gaps that we presently uh, have in terms of extreme scale computing. But one big, and some are in the US and some are in, in Europe, and they're, they're very expensive, you know. Uh, we can get certain allocations of those. But uh, from our estimates, uh, that's by far not enough if you really want to do and run a full Earth system digital twin in terms of computing. So none of these systems is dedicated to what we want. We get a certain fraction of an allocation and compete with astrophysics and, and medical science, and they should have their dedicated uh, computing as well, but you know we're all in the same boat, uh, and so in the end we just get a fraction. So that's one problem. Uh, so there's an architectural problem, a redesign problem that we have to take care of, and then there's a, a just a plain funding and allocation availability problem. Uh, and the computing creates big data, uh, so interactivity, and what I said before being a necessary condition for a twin means that you can actually dive in and immerse yourself in petabytes worth of data that comes in at rates of petabytes per day you know and how to do this at the interface of a of an hpc system which is in blue here in the middle and what kind of software you need uh, to deal with such data to allow that immersion and run these applications interactive uh, management of workflows and data flows is not easy so we have spend a bit of time on, on, on how to do that. And what you presently see here in this view graph, which I don't have the time to go through, is what we're trying to realize uh, with the funding we have available from Destination Earth. And then you can run these extreme scale 
simulations on, on very large HPC systems if you have sufficient allocations. You can stream data at full four-dimensional resolution and integrate these application areas necessary for making that link between the physical world and, and the human work. And you can do that on the fly, ideally. So it's not an afterthought. And you can design op uh, and optimize your system for allowing that. And then you can run in, in that data space that's uh, with a lot of hot storage in a super in interactive way, applications and access all of that as it comes in. You will not archive all of it, but you have a certain data space, a data window in, in all dimensions that allows you to do that. Uh, and uh, that requires a certain uh, architecture, of course, uh, and ideally that's scalable. So today's problems and tomorrow's problems need to be hosted in the same architecture. And machine learning obviously sits everywhere, and that has been mentioned uh, a couple of talks ago, uh, of course, for you know, emulating models, um, uh, dealing with complicated observations uh, in data simulation as well, post-processing, compression. Uh, there's, lots, there's lots of examples. And only in that hot data space, you will actually be allowed to, to both train and apply these methods because only there you have uh, the full data availability fast enough. So we're thinking about the design where we're uh, having contracts out there to realize that uh, all that works in, in within the scope of destination earth so as i mentioned at the beginning it's a uh, uh, it's a longer term program funded by the european commission uh, ideally seven to ten years uh, are the vision right now we're in phase one which is two and a half years i mentioned we're doing this together with east and humid such there's a certain work distributions uh, between us uh, at the center of which sits this complicated infrastructure and uh, at ECWF we're dealing with the heavy lifting in terms of computing and data that I showed at the previous slides and we will uh, uh, put in place the two high priority digital twins that we have for now which focus on weather extremes and climate change. Um, co-design, of course, is everywhere in here. So co-design means that uh, because this is geared towards societal applications, that we're trying to take those uh, along as we go. We're taking technology developers along as we go so that in the end, we develop a system that actually serves their purpose. And we don't develop a technology that we then try to sell to people who may have imagined something else. In Europe, and I think that scales up to international scale, there's lots of challenges in terms of uh, necessary synergies across programs. So while Destination Earth has its own funding, uh, partnerships existing already, uh, it's not enough, it needs more. It needs to interface with other existing programs that have invested over a long period of time already in many aspects. One of, of those is technology and infrastructure, so investments in high performance computing or cloud computing or data space uh, technology that exists. So we have to interface with that. Uh, there's, as you all know, a long history in, in earth system science and impact science uh, all over the place, climate science, climate model developments that needs to become a part of destination earth uh, as we go and feed continuously into destination earth to have the latest science represented there. And of course, in the end, destination earth is only a tool an information system to provide services to, uh, in the European case, the wider European Commission, but individual member states, but ultimately, of course, uh, uh, worldwide. And, you know, if we can take this view graph and, and create an international version of it, then that would be ideal. So I leave this uh, vision with you. Uh, go through this slide uh, again. Uh, it summarizes the main uh, take home points uh, from our point of view. Uh, but I will stop sharing now, but leave the presentation with you for later uh, digestion anyway. So thanks for your attention here. Thank you, Peter. That, that was great. Um, uh, very exciting uh, talk about Destination Earth. Uh, so everyone, if you have any question, please put in Slido and also please rank or vote for the question that you want to be answered. We will come back to those questions after our last speaker, but not least. Uh, it is my honor to introduce Dr. Michael Gutschild. 
Um, Mike is the Emeritus Professor of UC Santa Barbara, where he lead the National Center for Geographic Information Analysis for about two decades and to advance GI science. Uh, he is also well known as a father of geographic information science. He is a member of uh, the National Academy and the Loyal Society of uh, Academy uh, of UK. He also received the geography field uh, Nobel Prize. I don't know how to pronounce that, Mike, but that's <laughs> quite a- Don't. Um, <laughs> Uh, uh, yeah, so um, very well, they will learn um, uh, that one of the deepest thinkers of uh, geography and geospatial field. And his latest uh, uh, activities are on digital twins. Uh, so Mike, please take it away. Um, thank you, Phil. Thank you for that introduction. And thank you for the opportunity to do this. Um, I. I uh, heard three very interesting presentations on this topic. Uh, what I'd like to add is uh, a, a focus on a few issues which I'm going to argue are essentially issues of ethics. And um, as such, I think that I have to note um, that all too often, of course, we leave ethics to the last lecture or the last chapter of the book. And uh, I, uh, I want to start simply by saying that, that ethical issues, I think, arise all the way along this trail of um, digital twins and are things that we need to consider um, all the time. Um, with that, let me uh, begin with this, which is a slide put together for the October NASA workshop on digital twins, last October, by Danette Allen, um, giving a variety of definitions. And of course, her point was that uh, defining digital twins is still very much an open issue. Uh, but given that, I wanna focus on one of them. And it's the one in the top right, uh, which I've copied part of here. And uh, this is a definition that's, that um, holds the digital, a digital twin is a set of virtual information constructs that fully describe an object or system from the microatomic level to the macro geometric level. At an optimum, any information that could be obtained from the physical object or system could be obtained from its digital twin. And that was uh, attributed by Dennett Allen to uh, Greaves, uh, back in uh, 2002. And it's, it's, I think, important to point out that what is being argued here is something very close to a Turing test. So a computer scientist would recognize this perhaps as, as uh, the test originally devised by Alan Turing. And essentially what it says is that uh, any answer about the, uh, to a query about the Earth could be obtained either from a digital, uh, digital twin or from reality. And if the results were indistinguishable, then the system, the digital twin would have passed the Turing test. It provides answers which are indistinguishable from reality. And I wanna take that theme for a moment because it, essentially to me, it suggests perfection. It suggests that we can go um, into the digital twin and perfectly replicate the world. And of course, it's easy to point out that that will never happen, that it is impossible, that no twin can be perfect. And so this immediately uh, raises the ethical issue of what to do about the essential uncertainty that must be present in the digital twin. And let me just uh, very briefly uh, draw a parallel with the biological twin uh, identical twins biologically share DNA. They are uh, identical in that respect. But the actual expression of their genes, of course, is always determined by nurture, by the exposome, the exposure of the individual. And therefore, it is effectively impossible for identical twins to be truly identical. And I think we have to make the same point then about digital twins and ask what to me I think is a very interesting question, which is 
if digital twins cannot share reality perfectly, then what is the equivalent of DNA? What is it about the digital twin that is in fact identical to the world? And what is it that is different? How do digital twins in fact differ from reality? And I'm uh, particularly focused of course on the geospatial case. And I suspect that virtually everything that's discussed in the way of digital twins in ESIP will be geospatial. But let me just point out that it is impossible to measure location perfectly on the Earth's surface. All measurement of location is subject to measurement error. And for that reason, then alone, it's impossible for a digital twin to be perfect. So that I suggest raises an ethical question and the ethics, if you like, of imperfection. Is there, for example, a threshold level of perfection that allows someone to claim to have a digital twin. And I, suge I suggest that that's a very important question for anyone who is considering adopting the term digital twin to refer to what they're doing. How much accuracy is actually being, being claimed? How much perfection is being claimed? And if we were, I think, to dig in a little bit there, we would have to say that uh, digital twins are really a matter of fitness for use, that there are particular uses for which the digital twin is adequately perfect, but other uses for which it's not adequate. And that suggests that the definition of a digital twin needs to be tied to specific use cases. I have a digital twin for this. I do not have a digital twin for that. And that raises, I think, a very important question, which is the question of repurposing. If a digital twin claims to be sufficiently accurate for a particular application, what is to stop me using it for another application for which it is in fact not perfect and not, not adequate? And so that, I think, becomes a um, very critical ethical question. How do we advise people that the digital twin is being repurposed? How do we uh, help them understand that it cannot be purposed for other applications for which it's not fit? And how do we measure imperfection? Because it's easy to talk about measuring levels of uncertainty, but in fact, there is a great deal of difficulty as anyone uh, immersed in geostatistics or spatial statistics would understand, there's a great deal of difficulty in making reliable estimates of the uncertainty present in geospatial data. And then I think a very interesting question is, is why now? <clears throat> why the interest in digital twins now? Has some kind of threshold been reached? So have we somehow reached the threshold of perfection? And is that sufficient to explain the current interest in digital twins in the earth sciences? Because a digital twin, as if we define it as, as perfect, is never achievable. We will simply get closer and closer, but we will never get there. Um, perhaps it's because computing and data and models are increasingly abundant, but that process has been underway for a long time and it will almost certainly continue and continue to accelerate. And yet it can never, of course, reach that perfect limit. So what is it about now that is prompting so much interest in digital twins? And to think about that question, I'd, I'd like to go back to 1998 and a speech that was made, when in fact was written for delivery, but was never actually delivered, if you look at the historic record. Uh, delivery by Al Gore, at a meeting of the uh, California Science Center in 1998. And it described what he called a digital earth. And I have to say that this speech was put together by uh, Tom Khalil, who was a White House science advisor at the time. And I had some part in, in writing the speech also. I believe we need a digital earth, a multi-resolution three-dimensional representation of the planet into which we can embed vast quantities of georeference data. Um, this speech was quite significant at the time. Uh, it's still possible to find it on, on, the, on the web. Um, <clears throat> and uh, clearly, 
um, Gore understood that all the data going into this digital earth would, would be of limited resolution. Um, but there was some reference, but very little reference to processes and simulation and the kinds of questions, the what if questions that have been discussed in, in previous talks. Um, and that led to a, an international symposium on digital earth. The, the first of those was held in Beijing in 1999. And uh, I go back to the slides that I showed in the keynote at that, uh, at that conference. And they were very much an echo of what is being talked about today in the way of uh, discussion of digital twins. At the time, of course, the prospects for a digital earth were extremely limited. Um, we talked about immersive technologies rather than the kinds of things we can do today. Um, but, and a great deal of the development since then have been due to things like the uh, Silicon Graphics Onyx platform, uh, which in the early 90s became a, a very useful tool for um, display and manipulation of the earth on the screen. And of course, to Google it in 2005. Um, at that time, I talked about four different perspectives, and I think this resonates today in terms of the digital twin discussions. An immersive environment, uh, which today, of course, we can deliver through a standard workstation. A metaphor for information organization, something that's not been talked about very much in the digital twin uh, discussions. A distributed database transparent to the user. Yes, that's, of course, central to ESIP and a representation of the planet Stein X. That's uh, <clears throat> the modeling aspect, the simulation aspect of digital twins. So to come back to today, um, is a digital twin distinctive? Does it have distinct principles or is it just more of? Is it more of in the way of finer resolution, more accurate process models, more layer, layers and variables? And this to me, <coughs> echoes a lot of the discussions over big data. When we were trying to find definitions of big data, we often said big data was simply big because it was bigger than we could currently handle. Um, does that suggest the definition of digital, digital twin, which is beyond our current abilities, always a goal in the future and not something that's immediately achievable? <laughs> And is there a threshold level, and this comes back to my uncertainty question, is there a threshold level that merits the term digital twin? Or is digital twin simply a continuum uh, from today to perfection? I think if we looked at some of the examples that are on, on uh, the web, it's easy to find examples of digital twins that come close to being perfection in terms of visualization but fall far short in terms of um, simulation and modeling. Uh, besides what I've been talking about, I think there are other ethical issues which are worth uh, noting. Um, uncertainty, of course, is a major issue, I suggest, for, for digital twins. Um, the potential for misinformation and uh, deep fakes, false inferences, the kinds of things that um, <laughs> have become increasingly familiar as the internet has developed over the past few decades. And the question of privacy and privacy of individuals and the uh, lack of transparency, um, particularly when it comes to machine learning and the replicability of uh, the results of machine learning. Um, I just put together a, a last slide which echoes many of the things that have been talked about in the previous talks in terms of the missing pieces of knowledge. Um, we are still, I think, very limited in what we can achieve in the way of data fusion integration. Uh, interoperability of process models, of course, has been mentioned already. Um, the search for data and process models, the process of search, uh, spatial search, if you like, um, finding the ingredients for a uh, digital twin. The integration of digital twins across disciplines, across scale, across geographic space, and education. And what are the principles that we would teach if we were to give courses in, in digital twins? And 
is there a prospect, for example, for a um, common set of software that could be used in such courses? So um, thank you very much for your attention. Let me just uh, draw attention to a couple of the things that I've talked about. Um, number one, there is, of course, abundant and rapidly growing interest in digital twins across industry and academia. But <laughs> all digital all digital twins are by nature imperfect. And there are currently no standards for what can be claimed to be a digital twin. I've suggested also that fitness for use is a critical issue for digital twins and differentiating um, digital twins from, from each other. And I'm going to suggest that there are distinct links between digital twins in the earth sciences and the concept of digital earth and the literature that's accumulated over the past um, quarter of a century since the Gore speech of 1998. So thank you very much for your attention. I hope I covered some points of interest and look forward to the discussion. Well, thank you, Mike. That was great. Uh, very uh, broad and also in deep consideration about digital twins and what does it mean for us? How do we build it? And what is the real value over there? Um, so let's um, move to the questions. Um, Megan, are you going to be able to help us pull the Slado questions? Hi, Phil, it's Annie. I'll be able to help oh, with I, that today. Yes, please yeah. go ahead. Great, and I'll um, encourage if, uh, for those that put a question in the chat, if you want to move it over to Slido, it's, it makes it a little easier for us. Um, otherwise, maybe another E16 member can scroll through and see if there's something that we missed. So, um, we'll start off with the uh, most uploaded question from Pierre, and it says, now that many groups are building digital twins, how can we make sure that the digital, digital twins and their modules can interoperate? Yes, how do you want to do that? Um, I could take a first shot at it. I would say, yeah, if each of the, if the panelists want to go around and, uh, and answer mm. that, or if someone gives a fabulous answer and you want to defer to one of your panel members answer, I would say that's <laughs> fine. But yeah, if each of you want to uh, give it a go, I would welcome that response. Yeah, no, I, I, I'd say, you know, it's, it, it, it's a great question. It's one of the things that digital twins will need to be able to do, which is, is interoperate. Um, how do you do that? I think that's something that the, you know, the, it's, still evolving uh, through the community. Um, pieces of that obviously are gonna be things like, you know, well-defined interfaces, standards organizations, uh, those things are gonna need to be built, you know, as we see how uh, uh, digital twins in, um, interact. Um, I think some activities that might contribute to that definition are um, uh, federation, right? So as we start building digital twin prototypes and, um, yeah, and seeing how they work, being able to, uh, you know, actually doing some exercises to, to, to connect those and um, uh, see how they interoperate uh, for specific applications. And then from that, we can learn a lot about uh, what interfaces work, which ones don't work, uh, and where we need to uh, uh, focus. This can be things like reference um, implementations that could, you know, then, then move forward as well. So. Pieces, pieces of the puzzle. Thanks, Ben. Do any of the other panelists have anything to say about the uh, interoperability of the digital twin modules and uh, components that are being developed? I think things get very difficult when we start to talk about uh, different temporal resolutions. Um, spatial resolutions are something that we've done a lot of work on over the past couple of decades, but temporal resolutions, I think, get much more tricky. Um, and once you bring in issues of the nature of time, the cyclical nature of seasons, for example, um, that makes things even more complicated. So I think there's, there's a great deal of work to be done there, um, some very fundamental thinking and uh, some very interesting potential development. Thanks, Mike. Um, any other comments on the interoperability piece of digital twins from our panelists? Yeah, Peter. Yeah, I can add to me, 
I, th I think some of the interoperability problems have a bit of history in, in other disciplines that weren't called digital twins before, but now obviously feeding into digital twins, you know. So to me, I would say uh, the way we deal with models and diverse observations, we know quite well from metrology, you know, uh, objective methods to bring the two together, objective methods uh, to, <clears throat> sorry, to um, quantify uncertainty exist. They're not necessarily um, applicable to digital twins in just the same way, but we have a lot of history there. So to me, in terms of interoperability, it's, it's very basic things, and mostly interoperability of data, uh, depending on what the source of the data is, um, and metadata that, that is uh, tied to it, and the interoperability of software. And it's not just bringing uh, different types of software together and defining an interface, but in the end, so twins require scalability. So, you know, I, I can run a digital twin with a simple model and a bit of data. But if we're talking Earth system here, um, of a complex Earth system with all the processes and very fine resolution and, and billions of observations per day, you now these interfaces and standards uh, need to be scalable uh, to actually allow that level of interactivity and, and computability that we expect. If that's not happening, uh, I wonder if we can still talk about it. A digital twin actually so to me defining interfaces data standards need to keep in mind that this scales to petabytes per day or more all right excellent thank you peter um i'm going to go ahead and move on to the next question and uh it says given the lack of data available for the global south how can digital twins help or is there any unequal distribution of digital twin capabilities as well? I would say popcorn style, if any of our panelists uh, feel passionate and want to jump in right away, uh, feel free. Peter, go ahead. In the most simple sense, a digital twin can have no observations and just be a simulation model. No, it could be, because it's still a digital replica. Uh, you can still interact with it. Uh, but it is not supported by observations. Of course, if you have sparse observations, you know, of course you want something, something better because ideally it's informed by observations. But if you think of a digital twin that looks at climate time scales, that's uh, the future decades ahead. You don't have observations on that now anyway. You know? So the, the digital twin that has then a different purpose, it's not a, a op optimizing the operation of a system, but it's, it's important for the design of a future system. Uh, has a different purpose uh, but as i said before you know we have we have a quite a good idea of objective methods that can even deal with sparse data and also if you if you combine uh, a, a simulation model with sparse data because you don't have a choice there's objective methods for for doing that uh, and again, weather prediction and the history of that shows you that with the introduction of some of these methods the difference between skill in the southern hemisphere and the northern hemisphere almost disappeared, you know, because of these clever, clever methods, despite the sparse observations in the southern hemisphere. Thank you, Peter. I, I heard uh, the Mike? question as referring to the global south in the sense of the digital divide and the uh, less well equipped, less um, technically advanced parts of the world. And I think that's a huge question, um, which uh, has been dealt with in some areas of technology by the development of more appropriate technologies. And I always think of the case of Ushahidi, um, which is a simple phone app, which allowed a great deal of crowdsourcing of information in the global south. And I, I think something similar is gonna to have to be done as we talk about digital twins as more and more demanding of technology, we're bound to consider the fact that um, many parts of the world will not be able to keep up with that kind of accelerating commitment to technology, and we're going to need alternative solutions. And uh, that's something that I, th I hope we will see as a major research challenge. Yeah, and also... Oh, go ahead, Ben. 
I say it, it, it also seems to me that the, um, uh, even though there's less data, there's not no data. Um, and, you know, there's plenty you could do with the digital twin with the data models and, and systems that you do have available, right? And then as additional data and observations become available, those are the kinds of things that can be assimilated into such a system. Um, and uh, also to the extent that you're standing up digital twin systems, if they cover that, you know, part of the world, you know, they can certainly look at, uh, uh, at, at, uh, at applications and, and, um, uh, and questions that are, that are, that are relevant there and, you know, to the world at, at large. Thanks, Ben. So it sounds like what I'm hearing from all of you is that um, sparse data integration into models or into digital twins can, in terms of the question, um, can help, but because of that sparse data and advancing technology and the inability possibly with the Global South to keep up with that, that there's still, that there will be an unequal distribution of uh, the capabilities of digital twins. So uh, good, good question and interesting responses from everyone. Um, all right, another one of our uploaded questions from Pierre. Um, Economically, how do we ensure that the focus of digital twins doesn't siphon resources away from more foundational work, but, but rather relies, leverages, and rewards it? Go ahead, Peter. Uh, yeah, we get that question a lot, actually. Um, and I think it comes from the impression that digital twins reinvent everything, you know, so that, you know, for example, if we talk about a digital twin for climate, that that is like a, like a, a counter movement to existing climate modeling or something, you know, but I think we have to uh, accept that at the heart of a, of a digital twin, there's still a simulation model that can be a climate model, you know, so we certainly want to uh, have the best possible climate simulations or weather simulations or urban simulation if it's a very focused twin you know whatever or river shit you know whatever you're looking at uh, we want to have the, the best possible simulation model under the hood and so it's actually digital twins auction uh, with everything else that comes with them they actually offer uh, an accelerator for scientific developments at the same time as they provide an information system for society you know so we, you should really see it as a tool that helps both science and applications to do the best that they can because they come with so many benefits in terms of what you can do with data, how you produce it in the first place, you know, computing, data handling, interactivity and all that. So it's really an accelerator, a great platform to do stuff in a way we, we couldn't do before. And uh, that's usually give us an answer. And I, I think if you look at how funding goes, we looked at that in Europe, of course, because of, of that kind of question. I don't think there's any evidence that because of the digital twin funding that's popping up now, that funding has been taken away from fundamental model, developing, uh, model development or data simulation development or investments in observing systems or anything like it. It's rather the opposite, you know, that destination, that, sorry, oops, the digital twins act as a catalyst for uh, mobilizing more funding in, into all of this. Yeah, and I'd just like to reinforce that, uh, you know, notion that, uh, you know, the, we want to build on, on existing uh, models and systems and all the work that, that that's, that's being done on, um, you know, all, all kinds of different uh, uh, models and data simulation and uh, uh, and everything else, and you know, build build from that. Not, uh, you know, like Peter was saying, not not replace that or, or or be something different there. Yeah. The the next question, in fact, um, covers several questions that has been in the chat window and also on this list. Uh, which all our four speakers touched on that. What is the value brought by digital twins or what is the true difference digital twins bring to us in comparison to the early days? 
like the EOS DIS, the data system for Earth observation systems, or the Earth science uh, modeling, or other applied sciences capabilities, for example, the uh, public health and uh, the flooding. So what are the ad values or the true uniqueness that brought by these tokens? All right, I'll, I'll take a take a shot at that one. Um, so, um, you know, certainly all, all of the uh, um, uh, you know uh, integrated models have looked at all those those kinds of things. I think one of the things that the digital twins is bringing is um, at least with the kind of in the larger vision that that you've got all. All three of those legs, right? You've got the, the digital replica, you've got uh, forecasting, you've got uh, what if projection, um, and uh, you're also looking at, at multiple, potentially multiple, uh, you know, temporal and, and physical scales. And so being able to uh, tie those together to ask questions that, that uh, you know, answer questions that cut across those, um, you know, are, are some of the, the you know, at the at the vision sense, some of the uh, larger things that that's, uh, that that's addressing. Yeah, I, I think that's, that's very true. I think that um, integrating all of that into one package um, is a great um, ideal. Um, and it would be wonderful um, if and when we were able to achieve that. I think at the same time, <clears throat> digital twins are driving finer resolution. They're driving um, uh, higher quality visualizations. And so some of the human computer interaction issues, um, I think, are uh, well advanced with the digital twin. Um, it remains to be seen, however, uh, what kind of interaction modality we can we can achieve. Um, <clears throat> it's certainly going to be visual. Um, whether sound, in fact, has any role to play in uh, the digital twin world, I don't know. It's been a long-standing question for all of um, geospatial data, um, <clears throat> and uh, certainly, if we can achieve it. Um, the integration of different user communities into the digital twin um, can be a wonderful um, value added. Great. Can, Thanks, can, Mike. And I, yeah, I could, oh, oh, go ahead, Phil. Yeah. We'll, uh, we'll let you have the closing yeah. word, Thomas, and then I'm going to pass it over to Susan. So go for it. Yeah, so uh, I actually would take a stab at Phil's question. This is actually a great question. So the, what is the digital twin doing differently? I think this align with, uh, with the current effort on open source and open science. Uh, as we making our services and data is more available, more accessible, and computing is more accessible, uh, accessible as well. The question is about interoperability, right? Formalizing the interfaces. Can we develop reusable solution and framework and that we can plug in different model and simulation. I know all the ones that Phil mentioned before, they're very specialized. Uh, they're very specialized in, you know, require special like computing resources, operator. Uh, can we sustain these uh, technology and be able to connect all these things work together? And I think that's the, uh, you know, we're living in a time where we, things are more accessible uh, and we have a community that actually can contribute and improve some of these predictions and not just to limit to some big organizations uh, uh, to do this work, right? So uh, I, I'm excited with this uh, effort. Uh, it's not about building a bigger computer or bigger system. It's about being able to bridge uh, between organizations and, and, and agencies. And, and, you know, again, when I started this uh, um, panel here, right, is, is this is a community effort. This is a global effort. Uh, it's not owned by one organization, but really, you know, build something and and get the community to start build, uh, uh, contribute and extend. Uh, and that I think that's the the whole spirit of uh, uh, open source and open science. Uh, and I think Digital Twin has the opportunity to connect all this together. So, and I really appreciate all today's uh, uh, panel, uh, our distinguished speaker. Uh, I know you're really busy, and uh, you're different, um, and many of you are living in different time zones. <laughs> I'm sitting in a little street corner here, and I'm praying that my internet is actually not dropping. 
Uh, so uh, I'm so excited uh, to, to be able to connect with the world, even here in this tiny little world here that I'm sitting in. And, and I've learned a lot from today. And I think this communication or discussion will continue uh, long after today. And I actually look forward to meeting some of you at the, uh, uh, Vienna uh, in a April at the EGU. So thank you so much. Thank yeah, you, so Thomas. You, yeah, if I could summarize the um, comments on the last question, I think almost everyone uh, kind of touched on that digital twin is really a unique opportunity for us to drive the advancement of the instruments, the data collection, the model simulation, even on earth science discoveries. So we should definitely have more of these kind of discussions uh, in the future. Thank you. Thank you for our speakers. I echo the thanks. Thank you to all the speakers and really thank you to Thomas and Phil for pulling together such a, such a fantastic panel for us. I wanted uh, at, at the start, we had you put in the chat a few words that come to mind when you hear the term digital twin. And, and we had a request to do that at the end. Um, and we'd really like to see, did we change any perspectives? Did we change some thoughts based on what you heard? So I'm gonna follow through with that. So before you leave, as the numbers drop off, um, just put a couple, couple words in the chat about what comes to mind now when you hear the word digital twin. Um, what I loved about this session, and as I was reading the chat, right, this is one of those issues where we don't have all the answers, right? Like, and it takes communities and it takes people working together. And I love that there's some disagreement and there's some things we know we need to wrestle with. And frankly, I'll challenge all of you to say, how can ESIP help in that regard, right? Um, use us. How can we be a space where we can help advance these conversations um, because there's so much progress that needs to be made for, for our world? Um, so keep putting those chats in the comments. Um, I wanna encourage everyone, um, this afternoon, we've got lots more great breakout sessions, but especially at 3.15 Eastern or whatever your local time is, um, we will have another coffee break networking session. And I know that networking in these virtual worlds is the hardest part. Um, so I'm asking you to show up, right? Because if you don't show up, you can't get the networking. Um, that networking coffee break, we have some new features in Wonder where you can, you can focus on certain topics. And one of the questions that was in Slido this time um, relates to that. Um, with a question about NASA's new RFI that came out, um, scientific data and computing architecture to support open science. Um, Carl Benedict said, hey, I'd like to get some ESIP folks together and really talk about, talk about that. So that's one focus area that will be in um, the networking uh, coffee break this afternoon. But we also have the functionality to put other topics, right? If there were some questions that came up today um, that we didn't get a chance to get to, hey, we could drop that in there as well and um, invite our panelists and others to come and continue the really lively discussion that we had here, but just ran out of time to finish. So um, please come to the coffee breaks. Uh, we would love to see you there and um, help to make the most to continue these conversations. So looking forward to seeing everyone throughout the rest of the afternoon. And if you have not put a picture of your door or a favorite door into the Open Science Slack channel, um, please do that to help us uh, create a collage of the uh, doors of ESIP. Thanks so much, everyone. We will uh, see you later and drop your, uh, drop your thoughts on digital twins in the chat.